Okay, it looks like we have a pretty large group today, so thank you all for joining us today. Why don't we go to the first slide and we will get started. So welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the title of this session is EMV Charging Payments. And my name is Randy Vanderhoof. I'm the Executive Director of the Secure Technology Alliance. I wanted to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for playback along with the presentation deck after the webinar has been concluded. Also, there'll be time at the end for questions, so we encourage listeners to submit their questions using the user dashboard on your screen. I will return at the end of the presentations to lead the Q&A session, and I encourage you to submit your questions while the speakers are presenting so that we have time to view them and organize them in advance so we can get to as many of them as we have time left at the end of the session for. If we could turn to the next slide. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Secure Technology Alliance, let me give you a brief overview. The Secure Technology Alliance is a not-for-profit multi-industry association, and its focus is to stimulate the understanding, adoption, and widespread application of secure solutions. We provide this through a collaborative, menu-driven environment focusing on education and information about how smart cards, embedded chip technologies, and other related hardware and software can be adopted across all markets in the United States to make transactions and uh, identity access more secure. If you look to the right side of the screen, you see that the focus of our organization cuts across many different uh, technologies and, and market applications, including access control, authentication, healthcare, identity management, the Internet of Things, mobile, payments, and transportation. And even within transportation, we focus on mobility as a service, fair payments, pay at the pump, both for card and mobile, as well as the subject of today's webinar on EMV charging. And the benefits that our members generate from the organization is we provide training and certification services, uh, collaborative participation in industry councils, education, industry outreach, networking opportunities, and advance information about the changing technology trends that are in the market. And the way we provide those services is by bringing stakeholders together in a collaborative way uh, to promote these security technologies and solutions and address the challenges the industry has in implementing the best of those solutions in the market. We publish white papers, we do webinars like today, uh, workshops, newsletters, position papers, web content. We even do conference events and uh, in-person events focused on specific technologies and markets. We offer education programs and training and industry certifications, particularly for new uh, entries into the markets who want to get up to speed on the latest uh, technologies and specifications and trends in the market. And um, our members enjoy a rich uh, networking environment with other professionals to share their knowledge and ideas. If we can go to the next slide, please. So within the broader market focus for the Secure Technology Alliance, the Alliance's working committees are organized into industry verticals to address the specific ways that transactions are made secure around a common set of requirements. The Payments Council, which is the group that is bringing you this um, webinar, um, its focus is on securing payments and payments applications in the US. And we do that through industry collaboration and dialogue commentary on standards and specifications, uh, produ producing technical guidances and educational programs that provide uh, improving the security and payment infrastructure and enhancing the payments experience. Some of the council resources that we've published and produced in the past range on topics such as biometrics, contactless payments, EMV, um, um, uh, implementation considerations around uh, contactless enabled wearables in the IoT space, um, IoT payments, blockchain and smart card technology, just to name a few of those resources. And those resources are available for the public and can be found on the Secure, Secure Technology Alliance website. If we can go to the next slide, please. 
So let me introduce to you the, today's uh, panel of speakers. So following me, we'll have Oliver Manahan, who's the Director of Business Development at Infineon Technologies. He's a payments industry specialist with 20 years experience in the US and Canada, focused on EMV, contactless, and mobile. He was formerly a US product lead for EMV, contactless, and transit at MasterCard. He serves as co-chair of the Alliance's Board of Directors and also co-chairs this Payments Council. Jordan Kaplan uh, from UL is a project coordinator in the Cybersecurity Enablement Group at UL. And Jordan is leading various mobile driver's license and automotive payments initiatives within UL. He's currently involved with the Secure Technology Alliance Electronic Vehicle Charging Payments and Mobile Driver's License Working Groups. Barton Seidels is, is um, a Senior Director of Corporate and Business Development at Hubject, Inc. And Seidels and his team work with automakers, charging networks, utilities, and e-mobility service providers provide, preparing for the implementation of the ISO 15118 specification and the future of EMV charging, including smart and wireless charging and vehicle-to-grid technologies. And last, we'll have Nick Pizarov, uh, who is Director of Product Management for Banking for uh, GD Mobile Security, which is a worldwide leader in mobile security solutions, providing smart cards and associated software and server solutions for telecommunications, payments, transit, healthcare, identity, and authentication market segments. So if we can go to our next slide. I'm gonna give you a preview of the rest of today's webinar agenda. So following these introductions, we'll talk about the status of EMV charging payments, some use cases around EV charging, um, a review of the ISO 151882 uh, um, specifications on plug and charge technology, uh, open payments and synergies, and then we'll wrap up with some next steps and conclusions. So if we can go to the next slide. So before we get started with the rest of the agenda, we're gonna do a quick polling question to try to get a better understanding of who our audience is going to be. So on your screen, you should see a quick poll with five options. And we'd ask you to take a minute and just click on one of those five that best represents your professional interests in the business of electronic vehicles marketing. Okay, if you have uh, registered your vote, we'll uh, pull up the results real quick and see that we've got a very nice distribution of folks involved in the financial payments side of this, um, the technology around electronic vehicle charging, uh, some folks in the process, in the, uh, the network uh, providing, um, as well as uh, retailers and vehicle manufacturers. So quite an interesting mix of participants in today's webinar. Thank you. If we could move to the next slide, I'd like to then hand things over to Oliver Manahan, who will provide a high-level overview of the EV charging payments marketplace. Oliver? Thanks, Randy, and thanks, everybody, uh, for joining today. Um, if we could please uh, get to the next slide. And my goal with these next few slides is really just to sort of set a lay of the land of you know where we are with EV charging today, what some of the challenges are, et cetera. So I think the first challenge is um, for anyone who's either uh, owned an EV or driven with somebody that has an EV is that you know today you can go to a gas station and you've got pretty much 100% um, uh, assurance that you'll be able to uh, get gas into your car and pay for it without too much of a challenge. Perhaps the only uh, interoperability issue is a diesel nozzle won't fit in a gas tank, but that was done by design so that uh, you don't kill your engine. But um, as an EV owner, uh, that's not necessarily the case today when you pull up to a charging station. So you know there's a number of questions you may ask yourself and even if you use a uh, 
um, an app like PlugShare or something like that that gives you a bunch of information. Um, as an example, I have an EV that uh, has a Chatamo uh, charging plug, which is different from a CCS. And um, the two are compatible. So the, the first question is, if I pull into this charging station, you know, will the plug actually fit into my vehicle? Um, the next one is how fast is the charger? And even if uh, you know, you have level two and particular level three that have different um, charging rates and things like that. So how, how quickly will you actually get electricity into your car? How long do you have to stay there for, um, et cetera? The next question is sort of what do I need to gain access? Is it, uh, is it a free charge? If there's a cost, uh, how much? And probably more importantly, um, to actually gain access to the network, do I require a download of an app? Do I require a fob that I need to tap onto the unit um, to actually gain access to be able to charge? Um, and, and then once you get through that, there's all sorts of different user interfaces, as one might expect. Some of them are very intuitive and, and um, no challenge to, to get your car um, plugged in and going, whereas other ones uh, require a bit of back and forth. And, and once you've done it a couple of times, you understand it, but there are certain stations that just aren't uh, particularly intuitive, um, which is the final point. You know, will I understand the sign-in instructions? Will I need to call customer service? I've done that before. Um, download an app, et cetera. Next slide, please. So availability of EV charging, um, one of the interesting stats is that the number of charging stations will greatly exceed the number of gas stations and pumps today because of the nature of uh, electric vehicle supply equipment and the supply of electricity, which is sort of ubiquitous um, across the country, versus gas where you have to get a tanker to fill up you know, underground um, storage compartments, things like that. So you can literally set up charging stations in all sorts of places, um, you know, be it shopping malls, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, in the past might not have been conducive to the traditional petroleum station. But to be able to scale that EV charging networks, um, we'll need to have simplistic and ubiquitous technology for access and payment and deployment. So paying uh, for the energy supply. Next slide, please. And I should uh, I should do a call out to Hubject here, um, thanking them for these slides because I created my own. It turned out that they had uh, much better ones than than I had, so thank you for that. Um, electric vehicles. So today in the U.S., there's approximately 1.2 million. Probably you know it's probably 1.3 million now. These are are uh, growing quickly. But the projection is that by 2030, so 10 years from now, there will be 18 million electric vehicles in market. So you know a growth of 15x. And um, perhaps uh, not um, but, uh, the, the number of uh, public charging stations at approximately 60,000 today is expected to also grow 15x to about uh, 900,000 in that same time frame. And there are also some government subsidies that uh, have been helping to drive this market, uh, 7,500 in federal tax uh, credits. Um, up till a manufacturer uh, reaches 200,000 EV. So as an example, I believe Tesla has already exceeded that 200,000 um, mark so that the federal tax credit is no longer available to them. But then on a state-by-state -state basis, there are tax credits um, available as well uh, for EV purchase and leasing. Next slide, please. And this slide, um, you know, it's, it's not exhaustive of all the automakers. You'll notice like Nissan who makes the Leaf and Kia that makes the Soul EV and, and uh, one other EV model aren't listed in here. But these, these um, in aggregate um, it represent within the next two years, uh, approximately 50 new EV models that will be coming out. And um, the investment alone from these um, automakers is over $100 billion. And if um, anybody uh, was watching the Super Bowl on Sunday, um, or maybe I should say if, if there was few that weren't, but um, there was four EV um, car um, advertisements. Obviously, these are the premier advertising spots, you know, in the entire year. So just this slide is really, you know, a lot of people, you know, when I talk to them about owning an EV, will say, 
well, geez, do you, do you really think this is, you know, something that's going to happen or is it just a fad? I mean, th this is, I think, really indicative of the fact that it's every major um, automaker is investing heavily. They're all launching new um, new models. And, and so it definitely uh, is not just a fad. It is something that's happening and therefore, you know, getting the charging network and the ability to charge and pay ubiquitously is, is of utmost importance. Next slide, please. So from a sort of gasoline to um, electric equivalent of what it costs to run a car, it's sort of the, the $2.58 per gallon would equate to the average charging infrastructure of $1.17 per e-gallon. So, um, you know, not just um, it good for the environment from a zero emission perspective, but also from the consumer pocketbook, um, you know, far more um, uh, a cost effective way to, to transport uh, each and every day. There are three levels of, of chargers as well. And so the um, most basic is sort of level one, and that's the typical wall unit that you'd sort of plug your laptop, computer, or any other device into. Um, it's quite slow, but at least it's ubiquitous. And if, if you're really stuck, um, you can get some electricity into your car. Uh, for half an hour, um, you get two miles of range approximately, though. So it's not, you know, it's not something that's going to get you um, at far range in, in a short period of time. Uh, the level two charging, um, a little bit better, in fact, exponentially better. In a half an hour, you get uh, 10 miles of range. And this would typically be what people are using um, in their their home charger, where you can plug in overnight, and um, and also a little bit easier to implement um, in a network perspective as well. So you will see a lot of these um, as you're out at shopping malls and things like that. The final one is um, the direct current fast charging, and well, it's listed here in a half an hour, you can get up to 75 miles of range. This is you know a statistic that was probably accurate. Um, a few months ago, and if you Google, you'll see claims of 150 miles uh, in 15 minutes and things like that. So uh, the, the sort of speaking point here is that the level three is is really improving, and um, as technologies improve, et cetera, um, the range that you can get in a fairly short amount of time is is increasing quite nicely. Next slide, please. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jordan Kaplan of UL, who will talk about EV charging payments use cases. Jordan? Thank you, Oliver. So I hope everyone can hear me all right. But I'll be presenting on our electric vehicle charging payments use cases and the working group that we've been working on for the last you know, couple months, if not for last year. I've been actively trying to really mature and really describe what exactly are the potential use cases for retailers to actually implement EV charging payments or even look at this sort of ecosystem in their day to days. So, next slide. So, there are three different areas of use cases that we sort of divvied it up into. The first is private plus residential areas. The second one is public or semi-public for use cases such as retail. And then last is future use cases, so things that aren't currently available to market or still being in pilot. Now, I'll start with sort of the private and residential areas. When you're living in a apartment complex or even have your own home garage, you really want to be able to charge your vehicle or have you know, the ability to do so. And when you have multi-family dwelling areas where you have to share an EV charger, it, it really is important that a level two charger or the accessibility of these chargers is available to these people and meeting the span of how many EV chargers, EV vehicles exist. And I think that's really important because with technology increasing and DC fast charging, there's could be more demand. Moving on to our public and retail, workplace charging is another one. And it really is important because a lot of consumers are looking for where they can charge their vehicle and then go to shop, whether this be convenient stores or gas stations where most people can do this. It could be anything from street parking, restaurants and shopping. 
and you've seen a lot of incentives in the market advertising stores to increase you know or even add a parking space or two for these EV chargers and lastly for future use cases we have peer-to-peer -peer charging which is leveraging the charging stations at your house to other people inductive charging which is wireless charging which is considerably faster and plug-in charge which is one of the topics that we'll bring up later in this presentation next slide please So the first, first sort of use case that I really want to emphasize on is a night at the hotel. And I believe a lot of us on the call have probably stayed in a hotel probably in the last few years. And we assume that parking is available and there's valet, of course, if we need it, but there's parking there. And because roughly 2% of vehicles in North America are EV electric vehicles, those people need to be accommodated too. And with the average hotel room having 115 rooms, there's at least three or four electric vehicles probably expected to be at any normal hotel. And these are demands that are pushing the hotel and hospitality industry to sort of adapt electric vehicle sort of charging stations. Next slide, please. So sort of as Oliver said, the amount of EV these are increasing 5% over the next three to five years. And with the amount of hotel properties in the United States ranging from roughly 50 to 54,000 and the capacity being 5 million guests, there's really a large demand in hundreds of thousands of charging stations that are going to be needed to meet this. And the larger sort of hotel chains are already sort of pushing Marriott's Hilton and Hyatt are already trying to make plans to actually push electric charges to their you know, chain hotels. Marriott notably has already 3,000 at their locations globally. And this isn't just sort of a demand meter. This is a way to customize the experience for your customers. It's an opportunity for the family not to have to worry about whether or not they can charge their vehicle to get to their next spot. And it'll differentiate hotels that do have it and hotels that don't. A unique value add that will definitely come in handy in the future. And the point that should be put across as well is that guests who stay at your hotel should be able to use the same Marriott loyalty card that they're using to pay for their hotel as the same with their EV charging. It should be an easy, very flexible, smooth process, not sort of rigid and requiring a different account or credit card, if that's their preference. Next slide, please. So a more sort of common use case is a visit to a grocery store, which a lot of us do roughly one to two times a week on average. And when we go to a grocery store, something that's a nice value add is to really just charge your vehicle. So the average duration for someone going to a grocery store is 45 minutes. This is really keen when you have level two chargers that can charge roughly 10, 20 miles in that time period. It'll keep people there a little bit longer. And I think that's something that's really important in the future when people are actively looking for these EV charging stations to charge their vehicles. Next slide, please. So I think a lot of us have already started seeing the, the rise of gasoline being sold at grocery stores. And this is, you know, relevant for Kroger, Walmart, and Costco. But I think the fact that statistics shows that 14.5% of all gasoline in the U.S. is sold by grocery stores is pretty amazing. It shows that the grocery stores have found a need that people have, which is they want gasoline. And they also want to shop or they want it to be in the same facility. And they also want their loyalty program to be linked. This is something that's directly related to electric vehicle charging stations. When someone goes to your grocery store, they're going to want the ability to charge their vehicle or have some way of using loyalty program there. Making this a unique way to attract customers as well as extend store time. 
And a lot of grocery stores have Starbucks or a restaurant already located in their sort of larger stores. This is a good way to keep people there longer because they know that they're charging their vehicles. And same with the hospitality industry. The grocery store is very smart. They've already started implementing EV charging stations. These are your Publix, Walmart, Target, others that sort of have large clientele, especially in urban areas that really are looking for this. And a fact to sort of give out there is that the International Council on Clean Transportation found that an investment of $940 million would be needed by 2025 to really address the need from the largest U.S. urban areas. So if these grocery stores are able to get in front of the market, in front of the demand, they'll really be a keen area that people will attract to, sort of like a watering hole of sorts. And lastly, customers should have the ability to use the same payment method that they're paying for their groceries as for the EV charging. And this isn't just us in this working group saying this. Next slide, please. The state of California has already started pushing legislation. They're one of the biggest sort of states who are pushing electric vehicles, both intensifying it. Notably, San Jose is the city with the most EV vehicles, roughly 20% of their you know, vehicles are electric vehicles. So this law is trying to work to promote accessibility to these electric vehicle charging stations because not everyone has an account, but people should still be able to use that street parking electric vehicle charger. And I'm not gonna read sort of off the slide, which I'll also give credit to Hubject for providing, is definitely showing that if they're enabling contact and contactless with mobile pay being you know, prevalent, we're gonna have a bunch of unattended point of sale units on each of these electric vehicle charging stations, which is good. But if we have something like plug and charge, which part we'll go into more detail, this is something that we could solve a little bit more easier than requiring point of sale units sort of on every single electric vehicle charging station. And next slide, please. And with that, I'll hand it off to Park Siddle. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jordan. Uh, my part of the webinar is focusing on how digital authentication and payment authorization is currently being implemented by leading automakers and charging networks globally using the international standard referred to as ISO 15118. This protocol details the secure digital communication between the electric vehicle and the charging station. And the ISO 1511-8 standard uh, addresses four main use cases. We can go to the next slide. Uh, the, the four main use cases as shown here are plug and charge, smart charging, vehicle to grid, and wireless. Uh, only plug and charge is gonna be addressed here during this webinar. And in short, uh, this use case is really kind of the, the ultimate in convenience convenient and secure electric vehicle charging and payment. So all you need to do is uh, plug the, the charging cable into the electric vehicle, and then this, the systems using ISO 1511-8 messages, the EV will automatically identify itself to the charging station and authentication happens automatically. So it's no more using external payment means like RFID cards or an app or physical uh, credit or debit cards. And this protocol can also handle additional intelligent communication such as smart charging, which enables two-way communication between the EV driver and the smart grid. And with more EVs hitting the road, and uh, as already med mentioned, you know, predicted by the number of EV ads that we saw during Saturday's, excuse me, Sunday's Super Bowl, uh, Oliver pointed out ISO 1511 8 smart charging messages become necessary to uh, to manage the the predicted energy demand and to help avoid overloading the grid and then the third use case with 
vehicle to grid, it adds two-way energy flow, which is also referred to as bi-directional. And the EV becomes part of the energy ecosystem as a mobile energy storage unit and as an energy provider. And then lastly, you, the last use case, wireless charging, which has kind of all the benefits of the previous three use cases, but with no physical cable and is uh, really kind of perfect for charging autonomous fleets. Uh, with the wider adoption of this protocol, we really see the benefits of scalability. So on the next slide, uh, we have identified the, the key stakeholder roles within ISO 1511 process. Uh, they are a, a PKI and an ecosystem, the automaker, the a charge port operator, and a mobility operator. And each stakeholder, as you can see, there has a unique digital certificate, which is critical for, uh, for the secure communication process. Uh, on the top left is the PKI, uh, which stands for public key infrastructure and the ecosystem, which Hubject has already developed. These components help tie everything together and the exchange of certificates generated from a PKI is what makes plug and charge work. The certificates generated within a PKI enable the stakeholders to trust and authenticate each other. And the ecosystem, which is basically a, a bunch of databases, enables all of the stakeholders to securely exchange messages, store the certificates for reference, and manage the, the activation and revoking of the certificates. And on the bottom left, uh, the automaker obviously is the electric vehicle manufacturer, and they have a clear rule because we need a car in the whole process, but it needs to be identified and authenticated during a charging session. Uh, and then the charge port operator, also referred to as a CPO, is a charging station owner and operator. And then we have a mobility operator in the top right corner. They have the contractual agreement with the EV driver, including payment details. So now I'd like to walk you through an animation of the current ISO 15118 process of plug and charge uh, for authentication and payment. And there's going to be a, a high level description. So first we have an electric vehicle and the EV automaker has a back end that manages all aspects of the car, including certificates authenticated by a PKI. It can be either their own or a service provided by Hubject. Uh, um, as previously described, the EV needs to have a provisioning certificate, which is installed uh, in the car and is authenticated by its own uh, by its own or a third party PKI. Then the EV must have an ISO 15118 compliant V2G root certificate in the car's communication controller. Next we have the charging station, which is connected to a charge port operator's backend. And just like the EV, the charging station needs to have a digital certificate signed by a V2G root PKI to authenticate itself during the charging session. During the charging session, and it also needs to have a V2G root certificate installed in its communication controller. So now let's assume that the electric vehicle is bought, and the EV owner could sign up for charging services with what is called the mobility operator. This is the entity, as briefly described before, that has a contractual relationship with the EV owner. In many cases today, the mobility operator might be a charge port operator, but it could also be an EV automaker. And the, the EV owner shares its payment details, such as a credit card or debit card, bank account information uh, with the mobility operator so that charges and costs from a charging session that the EV driver um, engages with a, char with a charging station can be processed. And the mobility operator stores this information and then generates a digital certificate that needs to be signed by the V2G root PKI to authenticate the identity of the EV owner during a charging session. So this, this digital certificate, referred to as a contract certificate, can be installed in the car directly or via a, 
the charging session when it's connected to and when the car is connected to the um, charging station um, here we're just showing it that it's being installed directly into the car so now all components are in place for a plug and charge session to happen so when the ev connects to the charging set station via iso 15118 the v to g root certificate the car's provisioning certificate and the charging station's leaf certificate authenticate each other to enable a secure communication channel with a TLS handshake. This means that no RFID card or any other external identification mean like a credit or debit card is required. And then the EV driver is authenticated via the contract certificate Author authorization of the transaction is then completed and confirmed with the payment details uh, that the EV driver has provided to the mobility operator for settlement. So this is, uh, is kind of a very high level explanation of the components of plug and charge as described in the ISO 1511 standard for everybody to get an idea of where things are now and kind of a platform for moving forward. And uh, now I'd like to pass it over to Nick from G&D Mobile Security to take it uh, on to the last part of the webinar. Nick? Thanks, Bart. Uh, thank Jordan, Oliver. Thank you all for joining this webinar. Um, I'm really excited to see what Object is doing and uh, how plug and charge being deployed in North America and around the world. I'm sure that this is going to improve the EV charging experience as we know it today. Um, in the following few slides, um, I'll look at things from a payment per technology perspective. Uh, I'll present a high level picture of how the payment technology has evolved in the past five to 10 years. And most importantly, we would uh, look at through some ideas as to how we can make plug and charge even more powerful. Uh, next slide. So all of you are familiar to some degree uh, what happened with the payment technology in the past five or so years. Uh, we used to swipe our payment cards uh, when we were shopping. Our payment credentials were really basic and not well protected. In some cases, this led to under undesired exposure to fraudulent activities. Um, thankfully, that all has changed with the introduction of EMV chip card technology, and I'm sure that many of you have, uh, uh, have one in your wallet and you've experienced using it. So what is really EMV technology? Um, EMV Co. is the entity that defines a global standard for secure payment, uh, and it is really known to the rest of the world and now implemented also in the U.S., and it defines the cryptographic operations relying on similar cryptography as to the ISO 1158 uh, symmetric or asymmetric um, uh, crypto algorithms. So what happens, um, uh, what makes it open? Why is it popular? Why is it used around the world? Well, there's a few ISO standards underlying it, one of which is the uh, ISO 7816, which defines the standard of a payment card as to how we insert it to make a payment at a point of sale device. And also uh, more recently introduced ISO 14443 standard for contactless payment. Uh, as we know, can uh, use that with our contactless enabled payment cards or with our mobile handset. So in short, to just describe what that standard does, it allows us to perform a secure payment transaction in three basic steps. Uh, first, we authenticate the payment device, much like the V2G, as Bart was explaining, does authenticate the vehicle. Second, we authenticate the cardholder, ensuring that uh, you're the rightful owner of the payment device. And third, um, which our financial institution usually does, is confirms that we have sufficient funds to pay as what we call authorizing a transaction. So uh, this is all known to us using our payment cards today, but what is maybe not so familiar to the average consumer is a newer EMV open standards, what we call in the payment industry a payment tokenization. Uh, this is also outlined by EMV Co. So uh, next slide, please. So what is payment tokenization? Let's show you a few examples. Um, we are often using tokenized payments when our debit or credit card is in fact loaded into many of the things we owe or use in our daily lives. 
we trust those things with a copy of our payment detail. The financial institutions together with the token service providers such as the payment brands like uh, American Express, Discover, MasterCard, Visa, are the ones that enable payment tokenization and allow us to request a copy of our payment details and put it into various devices. The most common example today is doing so in our mobile handsets. Uh, where we enable them to do payment instead of our cards and we can use them uh, by tapping them on the point of sale device. Uh, but we also see that this proliferation goes even further into wearables like uh, watches, uh, uh, fitness trackers and other devices. And we also uh, have seen attempts to do so with, uh, within the automotive industry. There are a few pilots that are going out uh, right now with the traditional internal combustion engine vehicles um, to do payment within the vehicle. But really, this is uh, our topic of discussion today and see how we can uh, put our payment details directly into the vehicle. Lastly, um, there's many more additional devices that we will see in the future uh, our payment details being a part of, uh, most of uh, them in smart homes or other connected devices uh, that uh, are growing in numbers uh, very fast in the future. So next slide, um, really from a, a, a payment expertise, um, we believe that there is a very good synergy between all the standards used in the payment industry today, as well as the ISO 15118, um, and that we can integrate them to work seamlessly together to provide even a better consumer experience when um, when uh, drivers are plugging into an electric uh, to the charging station of their choosing. Um, so what does that mean is that um, we can figure out how in addition to the authentication that happens today between the vehicle and the charging station, we can actually incorporate EMV tokenization, uh, which, um, uh, which is a very well known and established process within the payment industry. So, um, so let's see uh, how that works within the plug and charge ecosystem. As, as the, the slide that Bar just presented to us, uh, with the plug and charge in ISO 15118, uh, we do uh, provide the same methods of authentication between the vehicle and the charging station. But this time though, when provisioning the contract of the mobility operator into the vehicle, we can incorporate a step of onboarding, an additional step of onboarding, or as we call it, tokenizing our method of payment within, uh, within the uh, uh, certificate that is going to be issued uh, from a contract perspective. So what does that mean? Um, an EV today has a relationship with a financial institution. They can simply approach that financial institution and request a payment token. Subsequently, that payment token can be attached to the contract before it's being delivered to the vehicle. Um, and then when we plug in the vehicle and uh, establish a secure handshake uh, based on the V2G route and to the certificate, um, this time, the contract does contain an actual payment credential. So instead of uh, using the one from the back end of the mobility operator, the charge port operator can actually retrieve the payment credentials embedded straight into the contract and actually clear the payments directly from the payment institution by using the traditional payment network. So this is really the new piece um, um, of implementing um, an additional method of payment uh, as part of the ISO 15118 standard. Um, so um, why do we need that? Why do we want to uh, introduce that additional method of payment? Um, it is known that um, there are many networks or charge port operators that will exist in the near future. Um, and as we see from the examples uh, that Jordan uh, was showing us, there will be a lot of use cases and a lot of growth. Uh, imagine we have in the future hundreds of charge port operators being that the charging networks, the power utilities, the retailers, grocery stores, 
malls, municipalities, and so on. Uh, the same as we can have multiple uh, or many uh, mobility operators, which are the one uh, holding the relationship with the EV driver. Uh, it is not really realistic uh, to expect that all of them would have a connection with each other. In today's implementation of ISO 1511, it is a requirement that the mobility operator has uh, some sort of an agreement with the charge port operator unless they want in the same entity what we call a roaming agreement for them to be able to process the payment. With incorporating uh, the payment credentials straight into the contract, these roaming agreements do not really need to take place or be established between the individual parties. So as I said, growing further into the infrastructure of charging, um, we are going to see a much higher complexity and a lot more players participating in the payment um, and the charging uh, engagement with, uh, with the EV drivers. So this additional method uh, we are trying to introduce would truly increase um, the interoperability and the uh, possibilities of multiple players to play seamlessly together within the ecosystem. So next slide. So um, in, in 1511.8 uh, today, there are two ways that we can perform uh, payment um, as we know it. If the mobility operator and the charge port operator are one in the same entity, or they have a roaming agreement, they will use the payment processing via the backend uh, payment processing of the mobility operator as Bart described. So that's really using the contract that the vehicle delivers. And then we'll have, um, as we know it today, a plug and charge. If that is not the case, uh, either those two entities are different or they don't have an, a roaming agreement between them to process the payment. Um, today, uh, as uh, California's legislation always also um, uh, requires, is that we have an external way of paying, much like we do today when we end up at the gas station and trying to fill up a car. We use our payment card or device at the gas pump to perform the payment. Um, but keep in mind, uh, gas stations are not the same as charging station. In case there's something wrong with the pump today, we can always walk in and pay inside. But for charging stations, there is no inside. They're mostly all unattended. So really, if neither of these methods work, we would uh, have a bad experience um, from the EV driver's perspective. Um, so this is really what we are trying to avoid and trying to create another alternative method of payment. So uh, uh, we, we got together and started working on an additional um, of a way of creating that payment um, authorization step uh, within the 1511.8. And uh, we've uh, uh, proposed a, a new um, uh, possible interaction, what we call now a direct payment method. As I've outlined in the past few slides, tokenization is really what can empower this new method. Um, and uh, when, when we do have a contract, uh, we can definitely use it um, uh, when possible um, to, to do a plug and charge. Uh, but we can offer also this direct payment by retrieving the tokenization uh, by uh, the retrieving the tokenized credentials within the contract. If and only neither of these two forms of payments are supported, then only we go back to external payment, and hopefully we'll never need to do that. Um, and the charging experience will be um, seamless and only complete by plugging in the vehicle, even though the entities that uh, support the EV driver and the charging infrastructure may be different. So um, as we are trying to imagine the future of EV charging, keep in mind, as I said, hundreds of thousands of charging stations, hundreds of thousands of places, um, as, as Jordan was explaining, uh, just a few hotels, grocery stores, uh, what this proposal really had is to help is to go uh, to external payment only as a last option. Thus, we will greatly improve the experience and at the same time, even often higher security. Uh, why is that? If, if you ask today um, um, uh, a gas pump operators or those in the fuel pump industry, 
this is really where they struggle the most as to how they present skimming from cards being used today. Tokenization from an EMV perspective really have, helps tremendously avoid skimming by providing a unique payment credential for that particular device. So going external payment using our payment cards is really can be avoided by use tokenized uh, tokenized credential uh, building within the ISO 15118, which would avoid that fear and, and that cost of fighting fraud uh, within um, the infrastructure of fueling, and in our case, within the infrastructure of, uh, of charging electric vehicles. Um, next step. So what is in uh, for us next? Um, first and foremost, we do want to say we definitely encourage the adoption of ISO 1511 uh, but also we are looking for a ways to evolve it in something even better. Um, as you've experienced all of our um, speaking today and this webinar, sure enough, we are a group of cool people, both experts in payment and security, and as you might imagine as well, also EMV enthusiasts. Uh, we have good ideas and we can shape the technology, but we definitely need participation and we can't do it alone. Uh, we, we need participation from the automakers, from the charging networks, anyone really who is part of this um, uh, EV um, charging infrastructure growth. We believe this is a win-win for everyone and moreover really excited uh, to be a part of this rapid growth of charging infrastructure. Let's try and keep it simple, cost-effective, being able to deploy hundreds of thousands uh, of those charging stations <clears throat> within the country without worrying about payment processing in, in fraud. Um, this uh, is the last slide of our presentation, um, um, and I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. Uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes uh, remaining for questions, and with this, our, our uh, uh, Randy, uh, give it back to you for coordinating uh, the Q and A session. Yeah, thanks, Nick, and also thank you to all of the today's speakers. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions, uh, but before we take those questions, if you could just go to the next slide, I just wanted to point out some additional resources for folks if they um, would like more information before we lose you today. So one is we have a conference coming up uh, later this month called the Payment Summit. And in fact, uh, Nick is going to be giving a presentation on this electronic vehicle charging. So uh, if you're interested in attending that conference, there's the uh, information to, uh, to register. Also, the Secure Technology Alliance has a Knowledge Center, which is a resource um, site on its website where there's a number of white papers and resources on other topics related to payments and security. And uh, the US Payments Forum, which is a, a separate but related organization to the Secure Technology Alliance, also has resources available on the implementation of new and emerging uh, payment technologies in the US. So I would encourage you to visit those sites as well. Um, if we'll go to the last slide, we'll just put up our contact information while we're going through the Q&A in case anybody wants to reach out to the speakers individually. Um, first question um, I'm going to ask of Bart, and that is, um, what is the current breakdown between home, workplace, and on the road uh, public charging locations? So uh, breakdown, uh, well, public, as I think Oliver showed on one of his slides, is around 60,000 current public charging um, installations and charging units. Um, home charging, I don't have an exact number for that, but around 80% of charging is done at home. Uh, but because, as we've seen with the success, especially of Tesla, is that you know that you need to have this public infrastructure out there to give people a level of comfort. So, you know, 60,000 is the current number, but it's going to having to grow to, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of units as additional cars are on the market. Thank you. Um, uh, Jordan, this question is for you. Um, is there any stats for retail stores on the economic benefit of having charging stations um, 
based on uh, type of customers that might use it um, longer time in the stores, anything to that effect. So at this time, I was not, I'm not aware of any stats that are sort of cited specifically for EV charging sort of having an economic benefit for the reasons that you sort of mentioned of it being taken from sort of the use case of gasoline being sold at these grocery stores. So that's sort of what we were sort of trying to base our understanding of how these economic benefits would appear. And for electric vehicle charging stations where a significant portion of the population is still charging their vehicles at home or at their workplace, I think there should be a longer, you know, dwell time and interest at these retail stores to actually do their EV charging in another location. Because right now, I think a lot of the population doesn't see it as accessible or it's just uncommon. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Um, Oliver, I'll pose this question to you. Um, um, can you uh, share how uh, a car owner's personal payment data um, would get um, um, entered into the car or into the system? Yeah, um, well, I think uh, Nick in one of his slides uh, showed one of the possible ways. And, and if you talk to any of the global payment networks, you know, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover also, as Nick referenced, um, it, it, it may be not too dissimilar from the way you provision a card, for example, into your uh, iPhone or Android phone or something like that, where, um, you know, if, if you haven't done anything in advance upon purchasing the car, you could in fact um, just take whatever your fam favorite payment card is um, and go through the provisioning process again, like you would with a mobile phone, but into your into your car's um, unit. So you know there might be some sort of IDMV process that that happens to ensure that it's you, you know, two-factor authentication, that sort of thing. But then, you know, in theory, you could you know set up your car like a wallet so that you've got your three or four favorite cards on there. And depending on where you are, you could pay for electricity uh, with one parking with another, um, perhaps even have a, a corporate card in there uh, for when you're on, you know, trips that might require you to expense things and things like that. So there's probably a few different models in which you could, but uh, you know, I see it as quite potentially the, in a very similar vein as uh, provisioning a card into a, uh, a mobile phone. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, question to you, uh, Bart, um, what is the difference between smart charging and V2G? Smart charging is when you have two-way communication, so the EV driver is able to it, it share information, for example, how long they're going to be at a charging station, how much energy they need, um, and they're able to share that back to the charging station and ultimately to the, the grid so that there's two-way communication rather than just only energy going into the car and then v to g let's say vehicle to grid or vehicle to x is builds on two-way communication so that there's two-way energy flow so that the energy is uh of course goes into the vehicle but with vehicle to grid there you're able to take the energy stored in the electric vehicle and it can be pushed back into uh, into the grid for use at some other time. So this is why um, um, EVs can be seen as part of the energy, uh, mobile um, kind of energy um, storage solution in the future. So two-way communication, and then it moves into two-way energy flow. Thank you. Um, this question is for Nick. Um, so if we store a payment method in the vehicle, we turn that vehicle, um, in, we turn that vehicle into a hardware token of some sort, um, and we lose that hardware token, um, would that mean people could buy stuff on our account if we stored the payment uh, method in the vehicle? Um, so yeah, Randy, the same as as, as uh, Oliver was giving a comparative example, uh, loading our payment today in our mobile handset 
obviously if we lose them those devices um, they are protected they are either protected by a key obviously for a vehicle to enter into the vehicle um, and they are protected like a, a passcode or a pin or any other form of uh, cardholder verification or card veri uh, uh, consumer verification so really the same would apply for a vehicle if we do have our credentials our payment credentials credentials within the vehicle uh, we hold ownership of the vehicle, so we control who access them, um, either by, uh, as I said, our key fob to enter the vehicle and to power it up, um, or in many cases through a mobile app, uh, which allows us remote access to the vehicle, and at the same time allows to control what the vehicles can do. So in that respect, I would say uh, consumers or, or EV drivers in that case um, uh, for them, the vehicle is a, a, a device, a, um, a thing that they have of a great value. I am sure that they would protect it well from an unauthorized access. And as I mentioned, the access to the vehicle can also control the access to the payment credentials within the vehicle. Okay, thank you. So uh, we're at the top of the hour, so we won't have time to take any additional questions. I want to thank all of our presenters and the people behind the scenes from the EMV charging project team within the Payments Council for their help on today's webinar. Um, here's our contact information, and if anybody would like to follow up with uh, individual questions, you can contact us uh, or you can contact me directly if you have any feedback about today's webinar or suggestions for any additional webinars. As I mentioned at the outset, the webinar has been recorded and will be available for playback along with the presentation deck after the webinar has been concluded. You'll receive an email with a link where you can listen to the recording and download the presentation. And please feel free to share this information within your organization and to others who could not participate in today's webinar. Um, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all and have a good day.